Fathers come in all shapes and sizes. They come with great gifts and they sometimes come with great flaws. We have fathers who represent old money and then we have fathers like mine who represent the working class. We're talking about one of those kinds of fathers here today. We're talking about a man you may never have heard of. His name is Joe Brooks. He had a legendary life in a variety of ways throughout most of the 20th century. And in the cult of fly fishing, he is an idol, a demigod in so many ways. And it's time the rest of the world knew more about Joe Brooks, the father of modern fly fishing. Throughout history, fly fishing has remained the peak of the angler's art. Other weapons of attack on dwellers of lake and stream and ocean may come and go, but when a man has tried every one, if he is a philosopher at all, he will come back to the fly rod. For the light wand offers other inducement than merely winning the physical fight. The greatest enjoyment derived from the use of the fly rod is not necessarily the fish caught the greatest satisfaction lies rather in the performance of the cast, the dexterous use of line, leader and fly, the harmony of the environment, and of man's soul. This story is incredibly important to tell because it's not a story about fishing. It's about love. So we had a bonfire and we're sitting around a bonfire and Joe just starts talking about, you know, the, the whole experience of fly fishing and, and the protection of the species and catch and return and all that. And then he goes, you know what? It all sources back to Joe, Mike. Everything sources back to Joe. It happens to take place in the environments of fishing, right? Beautiful, lovely sounds of the wind and the trees and the ripple of the water. But it's a story about overcoming, somebody taking a chance on somebody who's struggling. Uh, he decides that uh, he would like to do a film. And, you know, he was tagged along. I said, okay, I'm all in. He didn't give up on himself, Mary didn't give up on him, and he had the fortitude to keep going. She was by his side. There's the, the, the point that struck with Joe and I is the message of, of hope, uh, the message of uh, self-love and appreciation, and all that can be accomplished from that. Because what Joe did, he did in a 20-year period of time. And he made a, a commitment that he stuck to, and that changed everything. And it's a story about overcoming. What Joe in, uh, you know, pioneered uh, in the sport of fly fishing, the modern sport of fly fishing, he had to first pioneer in himself because he was a broken man. And so how he did all of that, we, we don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's a story for all of us.
Well, my father died in 1932 when I got kicked in the heart uh, in a basketball game. And this was, 1932, was really affected by the 1929 um, depression. And nobody had any work. You know, we didn't have enough money to buy mosquito underwear. My mother was left with four children I was the oldest at six. They didn't have welfare in those days. Um, it was called relief and it was a special government program. So they, they selected a home for you. The house they selected was in a black ghetto. I think when you, in a ghetto like that, and you have a tough time, I think you either get better or worse. And I think it was a really great life lesson for us. I am not impressed with anybody's title. I fished with some of the biggest CEOs in the country, presidents of the United States, dignitaries from Europe and all. But Joe Brooks is one of the most impressive people I've ever met in my life. There are many men and women who have devoted their lives to the art of fly fishing. The sports history is full of inventors and pioneers, but there are perhaps none so deeply flawed and so loved as Joe Brooks. This is his story. Joseph White Brooks Jr. was born in 1901 in Baltimore, Maryland. The United States is a far different place than it is today. There are less than 10 miles of paved road in the entire country. And despite shaky economic footing, the modern age is taking hold in the urban Northeast. I think it's important to understand to have a better idea of what America really was like when he came on the scene. There were no interstates, there were no suburbs, uh, none of this stuff. It was really rural, and there were just little towns all over the place, and around all these small towns were farms. There was a lot of wildlife, the streams were full of fish. Uh, we didn't have the problems that we have now environmentally. A great wave of immigration is changing the face of America from small towns and farms to densely packed cities. Urban America is just stretching its legs on towering steel structures and already the need to preserve and protect wild spaces is recognized at the highest levels of government. Theodore Roosevelt is president. During his two terms, he will instill a new sense of conservation in the United States establishing 150 national forests, 51 federal bird reserves, five national parks, and 18 national monuments. An economy driven by agriculture is shifting to one of industry. The Brooks family runs a small but successful insurance brokerage in the heart of Baltimore. Joe is a spirited child and a gifted young athlete. In the Brooks family, there's no, there's no silver spoons. There's, there's no, all the money that was made beginning with my grandfather was all made through a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat. We all had to work for it and, and uh, we all did what we did because we knew we had to work. And there's nothing easy about the sales business. Joe has little interest in sweating it out in the family business. He feels much more at home on the trout stream or the baseball diamond. At 17 years old, Joe is scouted by the Baltimore Orioles and eyes a career in baseball, but his father won't hear of it and instead enrolls him in Princeton. It apparently didn't fit. He, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was an outdoor guy. He didn't want to be botched up inside of a room someplace. He wanted to be outside doing something. 
There's not much on his academic record, but athletically, the guy was a stud. Um, baseball, football, golf, boxing, <clears throat> you name it, this guy not only did it, he was the best at it. After just one semester, he is kicked out. A few months later, Joe's father dies of a massive stroke. At 18, Joe was untethered and for the first time, free from the heavy-handed guidance of his father. And I imagine that when it was time to grow up, he kind of lost his, uh, his confidence and became quite an angry, angry guy. He immediately begins playing baseball again on the semi-professional leagues. Joe assumes a spot in the rotation for Long Lake, New York in the Adirondack Mountains, where he will throw two no-hitters and fly fish the mountain lakes and streams of the region. At this time, Theodore Gordon has already pioneered dry fly fishing in the United States, and the Catskills of New York are the epicenter of American fly fishing. Fly fishing really started centuries ago in Spain, France, and England mostly. You know, it was an activity that was practiced by elitists for the most part, fly fishing, and it was primarily done in sweet water. People then did not own trout streams, the general person. Only rich people owned trout streams, and you weren't allowed to go on them. And so, basically, trout fishing started with the rich. Fly fishing didn't gain popularity in Europe until the mid-1800s, when leisure time and transport allowed the general public access to fishable streams. Its adoption in America was slow and equipment was limited. For a long time, um, not good tackle was made that would you, the average person could afford. And I think that inhibited the, the growth of our of fly fishing in this country. People hunted and fished, but they didn't do it recreationally necessarily. People don't realize that spinning did not come to the United States till after World War II. You either used a bait caster or a fly rod. Fly fishing has extremely limited appeal in America. Primitive line, Reels and rods and techniques developed abroad are not effective in the United States. The idea of fly fishing, which was basically to present something that looked like a bug to a fish uh, by dabbling it somewhere in a stream, didn't involve a long cast. But by the late 1800s, America has taken interest in the sport and technological advancements in equipment allow fly fishermen the ability to cast line farther and fish more diverse waters. Once people became interested in it, obviously manufacturers started doing research and coming out with better and better products. And rods began to be made um, out of more sophisticated canes uh, and hollow cane rods were a huge investment, and, and then metal fly rods. The rods got better, the reels got better, the line got better. That materials for fly fishing were becoming better, primarily as a result of, of material advancements that were adopted by the fly fishing community, which was just starting to catch on. American fly fishermen are heavily influenced by the British, but the purest flies and techniques of English anglers were now being modified and adapted to suit the needs of fishermen in the northeastern United States. It took time, but then people began to discover it. America dry fly fishing is born in the Catskills of New York, and the early 1900s will mark a turning point for American innovation and passion for fly fishing. The rules are now broken, and the door is open to many new species. For each of them, a technique had to be developed. A fly had to be developed. So it all had to be developed. 
On the backs of American fly fishing pioneers, the sport rides a wave of popularity into the 1920s. And Joe has just gotten married. He was 24 years old when he married Arlene. And she was a year older than he was. But she was uh, on the upside of the social ladder, a, a blue blood, if you will, in Baltimore society. Joe's marriage to Arlene Dickey thrust him into the Baltimore's high society and into a free spending lifestyle of excess. And there was no limits on the, on the cash flow apparently and, and, uh, and they, just, they just had a good old time. The Roaring Twenties are in full swing and despite the national prohibition of alcohol, Baltimore's location makes it a hub for the trafficking of illegal hooch and the city is proudly known as the wettest in the country. He was a screaming drunk. My, my grandfather, um, you know, would drive down to the police station, you know, once a weekend and, and get Joe out of jail. Well, I, yeah, I know that from my grandmother and I know that from, from my dad. That was surprising. That was, that was very surprising. She told me, she said, I used to have to send your father down to get him whether he was at the police station or whether he was someplace else, I'd have to go send your dad down to get him. Just a very angry guy, and he was drinking then. And as my father told me, he was just a, I mean, he was just a bad drunk. He was a mean drunk. When he'd walk into one of these places, you know, everybody knew who he was, and they didn't want any part of him. Joe developed a nasty reputation for getting in bar fights. I think in order to complete the story, you have to know that there was, he had another life, um, uh, of which there were uh, demons, uh, if you will. Joe expands his athletic pursuits to golf and boxing. When he's not getting into brawls in the bar, he's doing it in the ring. He wows spectators with quick knockouts and holds the course record of 65 at Baltimore Country Club. He doesn't want to be in the family business. But he's having too good of a time, I'm guessing, that he doesn't want to leave that either yet. The fast-paced lifestyle is taking its toll. Unreliable at work and rarely home, Joe is quickly spinning out of control. So everybody was partying, everybody was drinking, and so it wasn't unusual. Excessive drinking and lavish spending have driven Joe and Arlene apart. In 1929, their whirlwind marriage will end in divorce. Then, uh, at some point, it just crashed. The drinking and all that stuff that was going on when, when he was living a good life uh, all came down around him, and it, it, just, it just consumed him, and he, didn't, he couldn't control it. And he's gone. Nobody knows where he is. The party of the Roaring Twenties is over. As the nation falls into the Great Depression, Joe simply vanishes. Millions are without work, homeless, and destitute. Joe Brooks is dead. Everybody thinks Joe Brooks is dead. Nobody has, has heard from him for a period of, of, of a number of years. Where Joe went during his dark time is lost to history. Years from now, Arnold J. Ducky Stewart, fishing and hunting columnist for the Delaware Morning News, will write a bleak, thinly disguised account of Joe's struggle with alcohol. He did not know what it was to draw a sober breath. His clothes were in tatters. He was dirty and forlorn. He was bounced out of one saloon and speakeasy after another. He panhandled from door to door and from street corner to street corner, not for food, but money for liquor. He slept wherever he fell in a drunken stupor. His friends had forsaken him. He was an outcast and drunkard. I think there are going to be an enormous number of people who see this documentary who didn't have a clue that he was an alcoholic. And now they're going to know who the real person and the full person really is. I didn't know Joe Brooks, but I know people like Joe Brooks who have all these natural gifts and then they waste them at some point along the way. He was just doing these jobs to buy his booze. His alcohol, his bottle was, was everything to him at the, until that point. 
Uh, I'd been a boy wonder. I, you know, everybody was, thought I would shoot the moon, and then I went off the rails. He was living day to day. God only knows where he was living. But you know, it wasn't on the top side of the hog when he was married to Arlene. People who go down as deeply as Joe Brooks went down and, and enter that dark era of his life become so self-absorbed that they think that they can always find an excuse for their bad behavior. You know, that people will excuse them because they do other things pretty well. Yeah, it's a strange personal life, isn't it? It's a very, very strange life that he led from the time that he left high school until the day he walked out of that sanatorium. Joseph W. Brooks, having passed the required boozological examinations and having been duly initiated into the mysteries of the famous Black Ball, is now free to roam the taverns and speakeasies without further temptation from the demon rum and also without snakes, crocodiles, blue monkeys, or other zoological specimens slithering or pattering in his wake. Crazy. In 1937, he graduates from the, the sanitarium in, um, in Toronto, and he has this certificate that says he's over his drinking. Joe emerges from the Wood Sanatorium in Toronto. The month-long program is a grueling course of poisonous cocktails injected into the bloodstream multiple times each day to rid the body of addiction. Later, this toxic treatment will be debunked, but clinics like these are the first to treat alcoholism as a disease instead of a moral problem. 20 years later, the American Medical Association will declare that alcoholism is an illness opening the doors for a flood of safe treatment and support for alcoholics. The second chance begins when the sun rises the next morning. And then the most important next thing to do is to pick out something that you love and that you're reasonably good at and pursue it with passion. I think those are the two most important lessons of life and they're as simple as that. What Joe in, uh, you know, pioneered uh, in the sport of fly fishing, the modern sport of fly fishing, he had to first pioneer in himself because he was a broken man. And so how he did all of that, we, we don't know. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if somebody didn't prod him into uh, going back to his, to his childhood and bringing that out. Because the one, thing, the one thing I think we do know is he loved to fish when he was a kid. He loved to fish when he was a kid. You know, I had a very lucky life. Things kind of came easily to me. I was in a career that was uh, almost tailor-made for me. But I'm always most admiring of those people who hit the wall, then get over the wall, and then say, look, there's a better way. Let me show you how to do it. And uh, so that's where, that's where his life really began at age 37 years old. There was a realization of what they've done what they've wasted, about how good they really were at one point, and then gave it up. And so when they come back and get cleaned up, and then they reinvest their passion for whatever it is that moves them, then they become, um, become kind of like preachers. You know, they say, I want to make the world a better place. So he gets from Toronto back to Baltimore. Humbled and reborn, Joe returns home to live with his mother. So the first thing that he does is join the Maryland State Game Fish Protective Association, which is a, a uh, conservation organization. It seems like he's becoming very much a, a proponent of conservation. Goes back to work at the insurance agency and then does other, other jobs, which is just earning him enough to live. And I want to make up for my earlier sins, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm gonna share with the world the spiritual experience of casting a fly to a freshwater fish or to a saltwater fish. And he becomes a conservationist who loves to fish and write about it. 
Working for the Maryland State Game and Fish Protective Agency, Joe sets to work preserving natural resources and writes in the Rally Sheet newspaper. It's grand to live in Maryland. The old free state has just about everything it takes to make an outdoor man happy. Fine fishing, swell shooting, and beautiful scenery, marvelous food. Oh me, what more could humble Nimrod and philosophical angler wish for? I, I still think at that point it's still a hobby. And he wrote not the fancy prose and all, but wonderful writing that was understandable and not offensive to the blue collar worker. In 1939, Joe and a small group of friends and writers meet near Thurmont, Maryland to camp and fish. The group decides to form an official organization of like-minded men who endeavor to meet each year and take a child fishing. The Brotherhood of the Jungle Cock is born. This is the beginning of the story of Joe Brooks, who changed fly fishing forever. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. I repeat that, President Roosevelt says that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii from the air. We will interrupt all programs to give you latest news bulletin. Stay tuned to this station. A Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor naturally would mean war. Reluctant to join in the global conflict, the attack at Pearl Harbor thrust the United States into war. Enlistment soars as young men across the country line up to fight. 16 million U.S. soldiers will ultimately serve in the bloodiest war in history. World War II, most people don't, they who haven't lived through it don't understand, but it took a big dent out of the United States. Joe enlist in the Coast Guard. Most military men his age are serving desk jobs, but Joe, takes a patrol boat post on the Potomac, protecting the nation's capital. U.S. industry now funnels all resources to support the war effort. Defense spending skyrockets and fuels an unprecedented period of economic growth. Millions of new jobs, dramatically higher wages, and the unification of the country are pulling the U.S. sharply out of the Depression and into a new era. It wasn't until after World War II that the common man had leisure time and disposable income of any kind. In 1945, millions of servicemen are coming home to a new country. All these guys came back from the war and they certainly wanted to go fishing and hunting and do all kinds of stuff. And that's when outdoor recreation, hunting, fishing, boating, camping, really started to mushroom. Certainly there was a um, feeling of communion. It's the main reason why I stayed with fly fishing. It's the most fun you can have standing up. <clears throat> That's when Joe started to pull everybody together. Joe was, was one of the first uh, who began to write about and fly fishing in general. Um, and brought it to the masses. Finn Kaiser was a fellow who started that newspaper down in, in Towson, Maryland, outside of Baltimore, because he was a rich man and he liked, um, he liked running a newspaper, so he decided to run his own. Finn knew Joe and they'd, they had hunted and fished together, and so he made him his outdoor writer, which was unusual at that time. Still a fledgling writer, Joe was one of dozens of outdoor columnists who are establishing themselves across the country. A surge of interest in the outdoors is giving Joe and his fellow writers an audience hungry for stories and technical advice. What Joe did was write a little column. I think he got $10 a week for it. He wanted to come up here and do a little column on me about being some hot dog fisherman for that little county paper he wrote for. He is appointed the president of the Maryland State Game and Fish Protective Association, and his star rises quickly in the Baltimore region as he begins writing his own regular column. 
pools and ripples. We went up just below the mouth, below the Harbor Ferry. I carried a canoe down and, um, and some tackle. He carried his tackle down. And when we got down there, I see he's putting a fly rod together. I don't know about it. I'd never seen a fly rod. He walked up on the top of this rock. Here were these insects rising. And he threw in these little rings and four cast, he caught four fish. And I said to Joe, I have got to have some of this. So I drove to Baltimore the next day in my Model A Ford, which took me several hours. And um, he picked, I paid for it, but he picked out uh, the tackle, the tackle for me at Tochterman Sporting Goods Store. And he took me over to Herring Run Park and gave me a casting lesson. Joe has just released his first book, Bass Bug Fishing, and his reputation began to expand beyond the mid-Atlantic region. And so he asked his boss, he said, withhold a little bit of my paycheck so that I have enough money to go down to this conference. The Outdoor Writers Association of America was holding its annual conference in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Joe was on his way. One of the things that happens at OWA, or Outdoor Writers Conferences, is a lot of people come in that try and get writers to travel to their part of the world and write stories on it. Um, it's a business. And Joe's future wife, Mary, represented the province of Ontario, and her job was to get people to go up there and fish and hunt. Nobody was going to Canada fishing in those days. It's kind of hard to believe, but this is right after World War II. We had plenty of fishing and hunting here. Mary Ainsley is the Travel and Tourism Director for the province of Ontario. She has come to Florida to enlist a group of prominent writers to join her on a bear hunt and fishing tour the following May. The trip to Ontario involved about 10 days and the idea was to fish all over Ontario and then write about it so other people would want to go to Ontario to fish. It was a dream assignment. But even with a limited pool of outdoor writers, Joe was not yet popular enough to warrant a spot on the train. He wasn't a prominent enough writer. They wanted key writers, national level, everything else. So he got turned down. But Joe's trip to Florida was a success. He lands a spot on an extravagant fishing travel tour of Alaska and each day sends colorful dispatches to his readers of pools and ripples. Mountains are everywhere. But strangely enough, the river itself is not clear water. It has a sort of creamy look. They say the color is from rock, powdered by the rending, relentless forward surge of the glacier. While flying, you can see where the river meets the salt. It is as if someone had drawn a line. With the success of the Alaskan expedition at his back, Joe is fishing and riding more than ever and an opportunity has opened up on Mary's tour of Ontario. At the last minute, somebody backed out. Mary decided, maybe I'll invite Joe. So she sent him a telegram to invite him to go to Ontario. They made arrangements and he flew to Canada. And they put Mary as the person to take him around Eastern Canada to show him these, to sort of be his emissary. And uh, they, really liked each other. <laughs> Mary and Joe would spend the next 10 days hunting, fishing, and touring the Canadian backcountry. And that's when their romance started. Joe was not a polished writer or anything, and Mary was, because she worked for, you know, she worked for the Canadian government as a public relations person. So she knew English and, and communications. And she really helped to form and develop his writing. And what we both, what everybody liked about Joe's writing, it was real simple and plain, but eloquent. This is the point where he really, really found his passion. And it wasn't necessarily just fishing, uh, because if you spend any time and you read his work, you, you find him really, really deeply communicating with the reader in a very unique way that I still read all his stuff today and I really enjoy it. Of course, it all ended up with Mary, eventually Mary and Joe, which uh, happened 
not right then, but a little bit later. There's a story that was told to me by uh, D.B. Waterman. Um, Mary was engaged to Joe at the time, and, and, and Mary asked D.B., do you think I'm making a mistake with this one? And uh, D.B.'s reply was, you'll, you'll never know unless you venture out. So she went into it eyes wide open, and Joe's promise to her um, to never touch alcohol again. And I think he competed every single day to keep that promise. That fall, Joe takes a trip to Oregon where he lands a 30-pound striper on a fly, setting a world record and sending ripples through the world of fishing. When Joe Brooks caught that big striped bass, he, he just set the stage for others to follow. I figured if he could do it on the West Coast, I could do it on the East Coast, and started to fish striped bass with a fly rod. His notoriety from that event grew, and then I think Mary just put him over the top. I think Mary made Joe. I think the love that he had for Mary made him a better man. And and we're all the better for it. It just completed him. It's an incredible, incredible period of Joe's life that arguably um, was without question in our minds the tipping point that sent him on a 20 year run of massive accomplishment And so they got married in uh, 49 <clears throat> and set out on a life of adventure. And the many accomplishments that he made after stopping drinking probably would never have happened if he hadn't married her. Now living in Florida full time, Joe pours himself into his job at the Met and fishing for anything that might take a fly. This is the time where Joe uh, got hooked on salt. Uh, it was also at this time that he specifically stalked and targeted bonefish. Alice Corson, the Miami Herald writer, predicted that Joe was going to deliberately go catch a bonefish. They caught two. That was a headliner. <clears throat> Joe had been in other relationships. Mary was his third wife. I think the I think the relationships he was in before were out of urgency or necessity. This one was this was permanent and this was out of love. And he made a promise to her that he'd never drink again and he never did. You gotta realize at this time there were only four hunting and fishing magazines in all of the United States. It was Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, Sports of Field, and a small publication in Nebraska called Fur Fishing Game. So there was no general knowledge, and there was no videos. There was, in fact, the fishing books we had were mostly published in England and really didn't have a lot to do with fishing and hunting here. So in two years' time, Joe goes from a a very accomplished writer at the Union News to an expert in saltwater fly fishing and through his love and his passion for fly fishing and specifically his newfound passion of saltwater fly fishing produces um, a book that is still used and highly regarded today, saltwater fly fishing. Joe's second book is a huge success and introduces thousands of anglers to the new and exciting sport of saltwater fly fishing. He also uh, wrote many technical articles which were not written. At, before then, most of what you wrote in the four magazines was exciting things, how to catch a big fish or how to shoot a brown bear or something. Uh, Joe was writing about innovations, casting, uh, building your rods, how to, 
all the leaders and this sort of thing. And so he was at the forefront of bringing all this technical knowledge, knowledge forward and getting people interested in it. I, I guess just being at the beginning of anything is a rare place to be as, as the world turns uh, and as everything becomes so much more complicated. Those were pretty simple times because it was the beginning of everything in light tackle and the absolute beginning of saltwater fly fishing. Everybody was excited about learning new ways to do things and how to improve it and all. It was a magic time. So the game was a new game and all the components of that game were new and to have been there when all this stuff was being figured out, pretty exciting. We didn't even think about making it a, a famous sport or anything like that. I've never done any of that. Joe did this because this is a great sport and I'm having a ball. And I want everybody else to have as much fun. That, that's been the whole tenor for both of us all of our lives is, hey, you don't know what you're missing. When a national magazine suddenly awakens to the fact that there are 43 million fishermen in the U.S., all potential subscribers, they naturally decide that it's about time to do a piece on fishing. But what do they do when they discover their ace feature writer doesn't know a river runt from a royal coachman or a channel cat from a blue marlin? Well, in this case, they hired Professor Brooks to educate him. School, says Joe, begins first thing in the morning. There were now articles and magazines that dedicated themselves to the outdoors, to fishing and hunting, and those were the things that I cleaved to. And, you know, kids sat around in barber shops, and there were stacks of outdoor magazines, and, and uh, the best part of that experience was waiting to get your hair cut so that you could read some of these fabulous magazines. And of course, uh, at that time in my life, coincidentally, Joe Brooks was the man writing about that stuff. That exploration opened up a new frontier of saltwater fly fishing. Bonefish, tarpon, snook, permit, sailfish, marlin, and so on and so on and so on. Joe got me into outdoor writing and the first thing he said was, don't use a big word when you can find a small one. And Joe taught me, although he never said it, that you don't display knowledge, you share knowledge. When you've been a waste for a long time and you finally beat it and you start doing good things, you want to share them. He, he was a leader at that point. And he was the number one fly fishing guy in a country at that time. If Joe Brooks said it, it was gospel. The thing that is the most astounding to me is how far Joe had fallen in the clutches of alcoholism and the way it controlled his life. It, it's it's mind-boggling to try to think about what what he had to do to un unleash or unlock that grasp to become his, his true authentic self. But Joe changes, and he overcomes that dark side. And it all comes together when he comes to Patagonia. Joe did these things like he was the one that got people going all over the world fishing. Well, all I did was interested in going to the same places. I never thought about, wow, this is a new concept. Uh, so a lot of this stuff that Joe did did not seem to be that revolutionary at the time. It was only afterwards that you realized that the, when they started building highways and building lodges and hiring guides and all, then you begin to realize the real import of this thing. There were no shows that, that 
that depicted these things. It was all the written word. So it was guys like Joe Brooks and others who became my idols. I mean, it was a way of sharing information. And that's what Joe did. He shared information. The genesis for Argentine fly fishing began in a snowy Lexington Avenue outfitter's shop in New York City. Um, Jorge Donovan was traveling from Argentina and he by chance met up with Joe Brooks who was pretty much a traveling writer in those days. Jorge meets Joe by accident at a fly shop in New York and he invites Joe to come down. Uh, he actually comes down, I think, if I'm not wrong, in January of 55. And that January, they didn't mess around these two, uh, in January Joe's on a plane doing this milk run all the way down to Buenos Aires. I mean he saw, he saw opportunity to explore. I mean, the guy, the guy was an explorer and discoverer. Let's, let's be clear about that point. And in those days, getting to Buenos Aires isn't anything like it is now. It's, it's not as simple as it is today. It's vastly different. All of the scenery, mountains, trees, crystal clear glacial water. Nobody knows about this place. It is hidden. The gem, you know, it's a hidden gem type of thing. He saw, he saw Candyland. <laughs> Argentine fly fishing in, before the 50s was restricted to a very tiny uh, fraternity of people. There was no uh, pressure on the ecosystem. There, was, there were no fishermen fishing. And for Joe to arrive when he did, it was just, a perfect storm. It's like somebody with all the ability to catch the fish in this environment, and there they are. And you have all these, um, you know, uh, famous friends of Joe's, uh, like Baby Anturin is here, Jorge Donovan, Andre de Ganet. This is the place he used to stay in the 50s and 60s. No I mean, Joe came down, yeah, probably six five, six, seven times. Yeah. I mean, this is just a great view. It hasn't changed much. Yeah. They would come all the way down to Patagonia, uh, which was a long, long way, uh, all gravel road. But they had the whole place to themselves, yeah, you know. That yeah. yeah, was priceless. Yeah. You know, the being here huge. in the 50s and 60s, oh man, I mean, even yeah. the 70s were great. So he's 54 years old, so he's not exactly a young guy, is he? He's no, a, but, but he's, he's a mad yes. fisherman, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He brought uh, uh, fiberglass rods, uh, you know, uh, fly lines that didn't exist here. They were fishing silk lines in, in Argentina back then. I mean, they were fishing like this with a book, you know. Yes, that's like, right. The English style. The English style yes, like this. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden comes Joe making a <laughs> <laughs> double haul like this with a fiberglass rod. And they were astonished. I mean, they, were, they, they couldn't believe what he was doing which they hadn't seen ever before, you know. So they were totally mind blown when they saw that. You know, and I can just I can just visualize Jorge Donovan and 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 BB on the river. Joe's first cast must have freaked them out. It gives you much more control of your line and much more accuracy and 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 uh, total control. You know, if you don't double haul, your your it means that you don't know how to fly cast. These are guys who are restricted to a particular style because that's what they they knew, but with that style, the environment w was working against them. You had massive winds, you have deep water, you've got big fish. You have to do away with that 
dogma of, 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 of going like this, you know. Uh, people like, like Joe Brooks changed uh, the sport. And then he starts landing those big monsters. You know, total heresy, you know, uh, breaking the rules and, and going against the, the dogma. He, he brought down the double hull, he brought down the, he brought down the fiberglass rods, he brought down the lines, he brought, he brought new techniques for knot tying. The effectiveness of, of catching fish, uh, doing the, I mean, using those flies, casting that way, using those rods, and reading the water, I mean, they have never seen that. The impact is like walking into a dark room and turning the light on. Well, it was just like total uh, uh, paradigm shift. He caught big fish, big fish, big fish, and then he puts it back into the water. But Jorge actually was the one who actually understood that concept better than anybody else, Jorge Donovan. Joe gives them all the tools and techniques to catch and kill more fish. But then he teaches them catch and release. Very few people are open-minded in order to absorb and to actually embrace new things that change their, 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 their dogma. It's those people who actually change their world. Today, every trout caught here in northern Patagonia goes back into the river. They were so passionate about that that they actually were, were, were compelled to pass the legacy to, uh, to others. There are individuals, there are families, there are towns. There are whole communities that exist, economically, are viable because of that, that inflection point in time and the manner and the character of the individual who was creating the change. I think people are not aware of the magnitude of the importance of the things they're doing when they are doing that. It changed their world. The prophet is somebody who enlightens you of something you've never dreamed before of a new truth, of a new uh, certainty that actually changes your life. Once you recognize who Joe was and what he was accomplishing, then you followed him. That's what you did. You followed him and said, what's he going to do next? Maybe I can do that. If he went to South America, Argentina, for example, and he caught a world record fish and came back and wrote glowing stories about it. Well, nobody knew that there were trout in Argentina. So all of a sudden they were aware of that. Now they wanted to go there, but there were no lodges. There were no facilities. So Joe comes back from this trip. I mean, it's amazing, right? So he's just had the adventure of a lifetime. I mean, a kid in a candy shop and eloquently writes about Boca fever, about the fever you get when you're fishing, you want more and more and more, and you're gonna stay in that water and get colder and colder and colder. And when that article came out in Field and Stream, to all of these outdoorsmen in America, boom, they all wanted to come here. They had to build lodges. Well, when they had lodges, they then had to have transportation to get people from around the world to get to these places. And then when they got there, they had to have guides, they had to have boats, they had to have all this material. So he created a whole industry that did not exist until he made people aware that you can go to Alaska, you can go to Argentina, you can go to New Zealand, Africa. He created a whole superstructure that exists today and considered normal. Oh, so here's the book. This is 56. 56. Wow. Well, Bebe, Bebe, Bebe and Chorina, yes. And then he came back in 63. 63. 63. 63. Yeah, because that's when they filmed the American yeah. Sportsman okay. Show. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. cool. In the outdoor television field, I don't think it was so much about distributing an idea um, as it was to try to take people away, to try to, to try to expose them to things 
that were their dreams. I guess Kurt Gowdy realized that a lot of people enjoyed the outdoors, a lot of people fished, nobody was reaching them, and he started American Sportsman. This was Kurt Gowdy in Lago Henro Paz, a glacier lake 7,000 feet high in the Andes Mountains. Joe Brooks and I will be representing the United States. We'll be fishing against two of the top fishermen of Argentina. American Sportsman was the first really outdoor show on national television. Joe was one of the first ones on it because Joe was famous at the time. Joe Brooks probably has done as much to pioneer and encourage light tackle fishing as any man in the world. He has caught over 80 specimens of fish on a fly rod. He's a great all-around fisherman, but fly fishing is his specialty. I know you read his many articles in outdoor magazines and books. He not only can fish, but he also adds to your enjoyment by teaching you how to fish and how to enjoy the outdoors much better. I lived in Homestead, Florida, and I would netted mullet at night to make a, you know, spending money. I never thought I could ever go to Argentina. I mean, I never thought Patagonia was ever on any horizon of mine. They, they were living vicariously that fishing experience through Joe's writing. His sentences were the only way that I thought I'd ever get there. That's the whole thing with Joe. Being able to say to people, you can do this. I did it, you can do it. Uh, they admired him. Uh, they would have given anything to go fishing with him. And so they did. They turned their TV set on and they went fishing with Joe Brooks. I think it's going to be a field day. Well, what do you say? Let's go. He was entertaining. He was still taking people away. He was still providing a trip. Winds are 50 miles an hour. Now, the wind is the greatest enemy of a fly fisherman. Most fly fishermen, when they see a wind like this, wouldn't even attempt to get a line into the air. But Joe Brooks is going to show you how it can be done under these abnormal conditions. So, Joe, let's see you go into the 50 mile an hour wind. It increased his name recognition and did the same thing for all of us who followed him. One of the most important contributions Joe made to fly fishing, and he made a lot, was the fact that he took people like myself, Charlie Waterman, uh, Mark Sosen, uh, a host of guys who were avid fishermen, and said, and taught us, encouraged us to write for the magazines, to do television shows, um, to demonstrations and clinics. Early 60s, that's when I called Joe. Because he was my hero. He was successful. He was a fishing editor of Outdoor Life at the time. And I said, you know, tell me how to get from where I am to where you are. Joe was a hero to many of the people who are, what are you gonna call heroes or, the, or people we, that fly fishermen admire today, because he was the one that kick-started us, got our career started, advised us on how to do things and conduct our business, and uh, was a man behind the scenes who wanted no credit whatsoever. After having an alcohol problem, and going down to nothing and surviving that. I think he wanted to show the world that he was more than an alcoholic. Joe and Mary are living in Richmond, Virginia. Having inspired and mentored a number of premier outdoor writers, Joe begins to use his influence to help establish conservation organizations. Up until this time, fly fishing was basically done by individuals. And individuals didn't share a lot of their knowledge with other people. What really kick-started fly fishing uh, for the general public happened in the 1960s. In, and Joe was a main person driving this. There was an outfit formed in, in, um, in uh, Michigan that was called Trout Unlimited. In Eugene, Oregon, 
they formed the Federation of Fly Fishing, and in Toms River, New Jersey, they formed what they called the Saltwater Flyers of America. Joe Brooks was the driving force involved in all three of those organizations. Having personally witnessed the power of collective knowledge, Joe inspires regional experts to become active in the protection and preservation of their own resources. The key to that was bring these guys here that don't tell anybody anything, but know how to fish in their area and form a chapter here and a chapter there and a chapter here. And they then began, they got hooked on sharing this knowledge with other people. And that's what really, where the word really started disseminating around was through these chapters and these different organizations. After fishing all over the world, Joe finds heaven in the Paradise Valley of Montana. My favorite place in the U.S. is Montana. I think Montana is the greatest trout state in our country. And uh, it's so great that I go each year and spend a couple of months out there at Livingston, Montana, fishing the nearby stream. For my great uncle Joe, this became his oasis, his home. He and Mary just fished the living daylights out of the state of Montana. Well, we've got six generations on this ranch. We've been here for a long time. We're in the, the north end of Paradise Valley near Livingston, Montana. The Spring Creek, when my father bought this place, had nothing to do with fly fishing. They, they were looking at it. They didn't have to chop ice for the livestock. That's all they thought about because it never freezes. It stays around 55, 56 degrees all the time. And uh, he was excited because he didn't have to chop ice. I mean, he had no reason to think about the fly fishing at that time. You know, that, of course, it wasn't even known. Nobody fly fished. My father got here and established fly fishing here. But when Joe came, that was another world. Joe, he started coming here when I was a very small child. It must have been in the late 50s, early 60s. And he lived on the ranch here in the summertime for seven summers. When he came here, this would be the only fly shop, almost the only fly shop in Montana. There were no guides. People just fished on their own. There was nobody floating. Uh, you know, the river, you could just go out and have it to yourself. But, you know, we, we not only have the Yellowstone, we have the Spring Creeks, we have a lot of other water. Joe begins writing extensively on Montana, and with the flood of interest came pressure on the resource. I think in his initial articles, he was pretty reluctant to name the Spring Creeks or which Spring Creeks he was fishing on. You know, financially, he could see my parents were struggling. I mean, agriculture in this valley was not an easy way to make a living. Uh, it's just not that good of soils. Joe and Mary and Edwin and Helen become great friends. And Joe said, geez, you've got this spring flowing through. Let's see if we, if we can't turn that into a fishery. And so they did. And they, you know, the Nelsons created a wonderful, wonderful spring creek. Not only could you protect the resource, but you could also get some money from this and make it a win-win situation for everybody. With Mary's support, Joe becomes not just the catalyst for a new wave of economic growth, but a leader in the establishment and protection of Montana's world-class cold water fisheries, raising funds to fight the damming of the Yellowstone, improving habitat on numerous spring creeks, and realizing a vision forged in years of experience. Joe and Mary create a fly fishing paradise. And then over the years, through all of Joe's promotion and then therefore the promotion that would take place in the industry by others, it started to become quite popular. Um, and people would uh, travel to come out here, it became a mecca. We grew. I mean, but it, Livingston became a place in the world for top-notch fly fishing for trout. Joe's work in the Livingston area spread across the state, and today, Montana is proud to be one of the top fly fishing destinations in the world. 
These are Joe's fly rods that he graciously gave me many years ago. This is my standard everyday trout vest that I still use to this day and it belonged to Mary. Joe's was too big for me. At their home in Richmond, Joe and Mary take three youngsters under their guidance and teach them to fly fish. When the three of us knew him back in the uh, 1960s, uh, <clears throat> we were just kids and didn't know really much about fly fishing. He had a gift for teaching. But Marvin knew him from doing yard work. So incidentally, I was his paper boy. One day, Marvin just took me down there. We just dropped in, unannounced as well as I can recall. And Joe stopped whatever he was doing, whether he was working on a chapter on his book, or whether he was writing an article, and came out and gave me my first real fly casting lessons. I wasn't doing very well. So he just came around behind me, put his arm around my shoulder and uh, put his large hand over top of mine on the grip and he showed me what it felt like to properly cast the fly. And that feeling is something you really can't describe in words. And that's, that was really the, the first time we, we, we really met. Joe was a man of words in the sense that uh, he was a writer, but uh, he certainly uh, relied on actions as his judge of other people, and uh, I think he expected them to judge him the same way. Okay, put a little wood on the fire. When Joe first started going to the Henry's Fork to fish with Will Godfrey, yeah. the Henry's Fork was not known. No one was fishing it. He was guiding Joe in this early period, and a couple of folks below them kept coming up, crowding them when they were fishing on the ranch. Will got out of the water, walked down to them, told them, I'm fishing with Joe Brooks, fishing at about your life. And if you guys get one step closer, it's not gonna work out too well for you. Then he went back and told Joe what he had just said. Joe left the river, put his rod on the ground, walked out to the fisherman, introduced himself, and asked him if there was anything he could do for him. By the late 1960s, Joe has risen to celebrity status. He's a household name, but virtually no one but Mary knows his daily struggle to remain sober. He didn't give up on himself. Mary didn't give up on him. And he had the fortitude to keep going. She was by his side. Uh, competition had always been big in his life, and I think that what he felt in, with Mary and what he respected about her uh, and what he respected about what they were together. Um, I like to think that that's what he was competing for day in and day out to um, avoid his, you know, the, the, the trappings of addiction that he, that he, uh, that he suffered with. I talked my wife into taking an extended trip after the bar exam, and we end up in Livingston on an island right in the middle of the Yellowstone River. We go to, to uh, have dinner in a very small cafe they had there, or breakfast actually, and uh, there's an elderly couple sitting across the room, and he said, I'm Joe Brooks. And this is my wife, Mary, and why don't you come over and have a cup of coffee with us? We've visited a long time. 
He said, I, I want you to be my guest on Nelson, so you just come with me sometime. And I said, I'd love to do that. And he was the icon to me. And so to have the chance to spend some time, to fish a few days, to, to visit with him, to have casual conversations off the stream about the fisheries and the conservation, I had not really thought through a lot of the catch and release concepts myself. And it was obvious from talking with Joe and from what I saw from others in that area that, you know, he, he strongly believed that if we didn't protect the resource and we wouldn't have the wild fisheries that we have today. And that was a whole new concept to lots and lots of people. It's, to some people, it's be a new concept today. And uh, it really lit a fire under me to try to do something to help those, those causes. I've been involved in a lot of conservation things from the Nature Conservancy boards to the National Board of Trout and Unlimited to other activities since then. But all of it was born from having seen a great fisherman in a great environment who was willing to share his philosophies with me for a short period of time on how lucky we were to have what we had at that time and how important it was to protect it. I left Montana, said goodbye to Joe and Mary, my wife and I are driving back across the country to, I'm gonna start my career. We picked up a newspaper the second day after we'd left and it's the New York Times, and my wife says, my gosh, Joe Brooks has died. September 18th, 1972, was it was just his calling card day. He was out fishing on Nelson Spring Creek, the lower section called the Joe Brooks Hole, and, um, and suffered a heart attack. You know, he kind of passed away on his own terms. Um, he always said he wanted to be facing upriver with a fly rod in his hand when he passed away, and damned if he didn't do it. Now, the day that we buried him, uh, overlooking the Yellowstone River, I buried one of my fathers. He was kind, he enjoyed helping people, uh, he had, he could see that the sport needed to grow and he had so many ways to help it grow. And unfortunately, people today do not even know that Joe Brooks exists. When he finally sorted life out, he, he was able to share with other people and to help other people. And I don't think there's anything more meaningful in life than to be able to help others. You don't meet many people like that. And when you do, you remember them for the rest of your life. A lot of the stuff that Joe did did not seem to be of importance at the time. It was just he did it. I think that's true of a lot of things. Long after Joe was gone, there was me, Charlie Waterman, and all kinds of other guys writing about this. He created almost a school that teaches the future generations. I think it's one of his biggest contributions. Mary was right with Joe every step of the way. Whatever they did, they did it in tandem. So every, every exploration, she kept his journals. Um, she was doing the, <clears throat> the writing um, right alongside of Joe. I really was not as aware at the time I spent time with Joe of his work with the Brotherhood of the Jungle Cock and the teaching children to fish and the taking taking children fishing. He was way out in front on that. On that. The passing along or the passing down uh, or up of information, I think it's in us. I think it's what man has always done and what man is inclined to do. I, I, I think it's just part of us to do it and I admire the ones who do and wonder about the ones who don't. 
when he died, he left lots of family, not biologicals, but he left people that he called family all over the world. He was my mentor, and he was one of the finest people I've ever met. He was very moral and uh, upfront and never attempted to promote Joe Brooks. And I don't know this for a fact, but I think he wish he could do a do-over, you know? Because what that guy accomplished in 20 years, it's, un it's unparalleled. I think without Joe, fly fishing would never have reached the pinnacle it is today. That uh, he showed so many roads we could go down that we would never have traveled if Joe hadn't helped us. So three years ago, we had this idea to make a film about Joe Brooks, who is our great uncle, because we felt nobody really knew about him anymore. And maybe it was time to maybe remind people about what he did and the pioneering and the exploring that he did all around the world. Of all of his legendary accomplishments, Joe's proudest achievement was his establishment of the Brotherhood of the Jungle Cock, and his legacy to the world of fly fishing is best displayed in their creed. We who love angling, in order that it may enjoy practice and reward in the later generations, mutually move together towards a common goal, the conservation and restoration of American game fishes. Towards this end, we pledge that our creole limit shall always be less than the legal restrictions and always well within the bounty of nature herself. Enjoying as we do only a life estate in the out of doors and morally charged in the time with the responsibility of handing it down unspoiled to tomorrow's inheritors, we individually undertake annually to take at least one boy fishing, instructing him as best we know and the responsibilities that are soon to be wholly his. Holding that moral law transcends the legal statutes, always beyond the need of any one man, and holding that example alone is the one certain teacher. We pledge always to conduct ourselves in such a fashion on the stream as to make safe for others the heritage which is ours and theirs.